don't you know who this is? She was thinking of something more special. Yeah, I'm downright flashy, you know. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Billie Holiday. Reporters keep asking me, Billy, why you do the things you do? This is what I tell them. I love me. We love you. NAACP says Billie Holiday is the voice of our people. I think we should integrate the audience for this show. Let's change it up a little bit. You know, blacks and whites sitting together. You know what you're getting yourself into when you decide to come on the road. Get out my goddamn clothes. I'm going to take everything except your bra and your man. <laughs> Which one of my songs is your favorite song? Strange Fruit. Yeah, it's a song about important things, you know, things that are going on in the country. This holiday woman's causing a lot of people to think the wrong things. It's a starting gun for this so-called civil rights movement. Those lyrics provoke people. Y'all got a plan? She's a drug addict. Exactly. I cut strange fruit. I want to sing the damn song. It's for your own good, OK? I say what the fuck I want. That stage. They're strange fruit. They won't let me sing nowhere. No clubs, no money, no nothing. You gotta understand, baby. Right now, I'm in a situation. But you said we could beat this, Billy. I need some now. Blood on the leaves. You're like a hammer. Come right back and it hit harder than before. She's singing it for all of us. Ain't no other Negro star bold enough to do it. Black body swinging. I'm being followed. I'm not gonna count in no fizz. In the southern breeze. She's made something of herself, and you can't take it because she's strong, beautiful, and black. Strange fruit hanging from the Trees. You think I'm gonna stop singing that song? Your grandkids will be singing Strange Fruit. Hi, my name is Gil Robertson, president of the African American Film Critics Association. Today we have a great, great episode of Africa Roundtables uh, that spotlights the upcoming Hulu film, The United, United States versus Billie Holiday. Andra uh, is absolutely amazing. And Trevante, you were good too. So I'm gonna, I'm Thanks, gonna introduce you to um, our cast members, our, our, our AFCA members who are taking part today in uh, this round table, starting with Katia Woods, our facilitator in Philadelphia, Mercedes Springer in Atlanta, KB in Houston, Texas, Ray Cornelius in Atlanta, Rhonda Rasha Penrise in Atlanta, Nancy Green in Los Angeles, Sharonda Williams in Atlanta, and Carolyn Hines in Toronto. You guys do what you do so well, and I will see you sh uh, shortly. Hey, B here with the Color Grade Podcast. And my question is for Andra. You know, your acting performance and your singing as Billy is just otherworldly. So, so, so fantastic in this. So, you know, but there was so much more to Billie Holiday than I think that people realize. So for those individuals who are coming to know her for the very first time through this project, what do you really hope that your soul story, um, soul stirring, excuse me, portrayal will really teach them? Um, and what do you hope that they take away, you know, about this legendary woman and artist? Um, sorry, I'm not supposed to start with um, <laughs> but uh, uh, well, first I would like to say that Trevante was spectacular. I know I was on set; it was amazing. <laughs> Um, and also that it it really took a gargantuan effort by him and all my castmates um, pouring into me and being as as dignified and being have so much integrity and having the talent that they had they poured into me in such a way that really allowed me and gave me the space to perform the way that I did so it was I think that's why emotionally I still am just so you know just love the experience and so connected to them so 
Um, first, I definitely want people to know that it was just a beautifully collaborative effort by a group of beautiful black people telling a beautiful black story. Um, and so that, that just logistically speaking was a great part of it. But I think what I want them to pull from, from, um, from Billy, well, from Billy is to know that she was truly the godmother of civil rights. You know, this woman, they didn't go after her because she was a drug addict. They used a war on drugs as a guise to go after her for singing Strange Fruit, for integrating audiences. She was one of the first artists to integrate Carnegie Hall. Um, and, and her message, her message was one of unity. Her message was one of stopping racial terror in America. And so that, that obviously, as you know, is very dangerous if you're trying to continue a system of oppression. And so she was, she was a threat to them and to the way of life they wanted to uphold. And um, so she was truly the godmother of civil rights. And, and she did this unto her demise. You know, she, they say she died of cirrhosis of the liver, but they wanted her to kill herself and they would plant drugs on her and set her up. Um, and then lastly, the thing I want people to pull from this movie is that black stories are constantly suppressed and or or the narrative is changed. Um, and Trey's heard this a million times, but to really limit the scope of our struggle and our contribution. Um, and when you know those two things about people, it's very hard to continue in hate. And so I really hope this continues the practice of taking the lid off of our stories and telling the truth about our narratives. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You know, fantastic performances from you and Trevante. So thank, thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Mercedes here with She Critiques in Atlanta. Um, this film differs a lot from what we know in Lady Sings the Blues, a lot of exposing of uh, Billie Holiday and who she really was. One of the big differences is the introduction of Jimmy Fletcher in the main storyline. Trevante, why do you think uh, Jimmy's character and his presence in this film was necessary to Billy's story? I think it was necessary just because, at least from my point of view, uh, having the opportunity to show just another perspective, just to really dip into that stream of the Black male experience and then to show another facet of a relationship that somebody has with a powerful black woman trying to make change in the world during the time. So it was just a, it was just a cool experience and a cool way to show another light really. Absolutely, thank you so much. Amazing film. Thank you. Hello guys, Katka Woods, Couple Social. Toronto, my question is for you. Um, how much did you learn about uh, black Black men's particular association with the FBI, it's a, especially seeing the notorious relationship that the borough had with Black people, civil rights leaders. How did your research go and where did you start? So my research started with my grandfather. You know, he, uh, well, he served in the Vietnam War. And so that's kind of where I took most of my influence from. And, his swagger. And so, and then really just, I guess just in reference to the FBI aspect of the film, just reading the books and then uh, doing that research. But I, I more pull from uh, personal experiences when I try to cultivate a character, to be honest. Uh, I mean, historically and through class and school and all these things you learn uh, all of that. But like I said, I just try to bring all of that together and just make this person, to be honest. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Caroline. Hi, first person. Here's what happened podcast. Um, my question is for Andra. So in Billy's memoir, she mentioned singing Strange Fruit always was made her depressed and it took a lot out of her physically and emotionally to sing it. Did you have that experience during production and film and recording the song? And also, is there any song from your own personal repertoire that kind of evokes the same emotional um, exhaustion or just makes you feel so much when you sing it? Uh, you know, it was breaking up right in the beginning of what you said, but the gist of what you were saying was was that, um, uh, it was that bell, it was that bell service, huh? <laughs> um, but the, the gist of what you were saying was just, Billy would describe that taking strength, singing Strange Fruit would take like everything out of her. And is there a similar song that I have um, 
that does yes. okay, that does something yes uh yes yeah, so i mean singing the song on set definitely takes it takes everything out of you it also draws up things in you that you didn't realize were there and the things that you didn't realize you were dealing with and then i also there's such a sense of urgency you know i've sung strange fruit before for um work we did with the with brian stevenson and the equal justice initiative but you know that was very it was performance based and it was an homage to billy holiday singing it on set was it was such a sense of urgency. You know, I, I think there's something interesting that happens when you're playing someone who's gonna die and someone who I believe had an awareness that she was gonna die because she would say that Harry is gonna kill me. Harry Jansen is gonna kill me. I think he's gonna kill me. And, um, and so there was a sense of urgency, right? There's, I think that the, what was exhausting is that people would sit in the audience and they would enjoy the song and they'd go, wow, it's so beautiful. It's so powerful. It's so moving. And then there would be no change that would happen. You know, they, they wouldn't feel moved enough to maybe, you know, talk to their friends or their neighbors or their city councils or, and to, and to do something about the lynching that was happening. So, you know, I think it's emotionally exhausting because, you know, her father was ultimately died as a victim of Jim Crow. Um, and then because, you know, people's, people are enjoying a song that they shouldn't be enjoying. They should be moved and motivated to act. Uh, I mean, in my life, I, I, I think it would be silly of me to try to compare me singing one of my songs in the time that I'm singing them to what Billy went through singing Strange Fruit in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, but I will say, uh, I think the, the duty, you know, and the need um, to be a support system for people rise up, obviously, definitely takes, takes a lot out, uh, just because it's exposed me. I think more than anything, it's exposed me to so many people. I've I've had people, multiple people, it's normal for people to tell me I was gonna kill myself, but I didn't because I listened to your song or your song helped me to fight cancer or your song helped me to get over the death of a family member or a loved one, or I was dealing with deep depression. And you know, so it's when you're dealing with people who are, who are telling you such weighty stories and how your song impacted them, you know, it, it definitely weighs on you, it sits in you, but it, it feeds you as well too. Um, much as I think maybe the need to sing Strange Fruit and to talk about racial terror in America fed Billie Holiday, so. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I hope service gets better over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Congratulations, Andra and Trevante. You guys did an amazing, amazing job. My question is for Andra. This is Ray Cornelius, I'm sorry, with Upfront Inside yeah. the Entertainment Industry. My question is, you know, when I first heard you open your mouth and speak as Billie Holiday, I was like, she has embodied this character. And I found out that you worked with Tasha Smith to develop this Billie Holiday character. Can you talk about that transformation and, and some of the tips that she gave you to become Billie Holiday? Uh, yeah, it was so much, if, if you have time. <laughs> um, it was a lot. I mean, you know, it was, it was a lesson in acting and uh, truncated right you know what I mean so it was I think it was we needed to get a lot done um I mean first of all a I will just tell you Tasha is a beautiful person she's also a praying person and she knows that about me as well too and so we met in a place spiritually before we ever even did the work emotionally or with the script um and so so uh yeah she it was a lot of work just on the script right and how to inform I guess I learned how to inform a character, you know, with my own personal experience, um, two things, how to inform a character and then how to be present and react to whoever I'm in, I'm in the scene with at the time. And so, um, uh, so it was going through the script work and then it was also teaching me how to draw up emotions from certain experiences because I'm very, I don't know, I think I have like a delete trauma mentality. I'm like, if that shit was too traumatic, I'm like, nah, you know, put it somewhere else. <laughs> but, but, um, you know, I think that, uh, and, and there's just things in my life that I've, I've not compartmentalized, I say lay down um, in order to be healthy and to be whole and move forward. So it was how to draw those things up, how to hold on to them. She would always say now, now cap it. You know what I mean? Like now hold on to it, which was really challenging for, for me because it just was counterintuitive, right? To being a healthy person. And then script work, um, you know, how to see real experiences, things that I've, I've gone through or things that I've done, you know, in the margins of the script, you know, and um, so I always say, like, for instance, my experience, there's a scene where, where Jimmy's character or Trey's character comes and visits me in prison, and, 
you know, I'm not mad at him. I love working with him. So, I, you know, I can't look at him and be like, you know, fuck you. You know what I mean? So I had to like imagine somebody who deeply betrayed me and my family from um, a certain church that we went to. And so it was like just filling in the spaces and like that and living in those spaces. Um, tons of research, reading every single book, um, every documentary, every image, every audio that we could get of her. Um, and uh, my dialect coach and I, Tom Jones, tried to understand her breathing, where her voice comes from. So, I mean, it's, it's a lot, it just, you know, and then there's the physical transformation, the losing weight, the cutting my hair, the smoking cigarettes, the drinking alcohol, which I don't typically do. So it was, you know, it was a whole body, spirit, mind um, transformation, um, you know, that I would do again, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that answers. <laughs> I get long-winded and tangential sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this is Nancy Green with Film Critic. And my question is for Andra. Um, I wanted to know uh, the scene when Billie Holiday comes up on the field uh, and she sees the lynching. And the, that whole uh, transition, how was that film? And how did you get into the space uh, for that? Because it was a very a deeply emotional scene. And I think it really portrayed how Billy had to go from being who she was to being her persona on stage. Uh, yeah, um, God, that one's always like a heavy, heavy one to answer. I mean, it was a heavy scene, so it'd be a heavy one to answer. But um, um, I mean, prayer first, everything really started, began and ended with prayer for me on set. Uh, and to get into the scene, I mean, you know, I was just telling somebody just a little bit ago that we sort of live kind of, right, with this trauma in our DNA, you know, and, and unfortunately. Um, and uh, so it was, you know, just realizing the time that I was in and realizing that, you know, that person on that tree, not only could it be a loved one, it is a loved one, you know what I mean? It is family, it is, you know, kin, and for me, it was a combination of things, right? I'm, I'm still a black woman living in America. And so there's, it has its own set of social issues uh, that, that I could pull from, you know, to, to realize this emotional moment. And, um, but the part of it that bothered me was having to pull from personal trauma, you know? And because I just thought I sh lynching is such an awful thing. I should not have to pull from something personal to realize the emotions I needed. But it just made me realize, as I've said before, that, that um, you know, we're too familiar with this magnitude of, of, of um, sort of pain, right? And loss, you know, um, and, and there's these sort of things executed against us, um, but also that level of triumph, you know, now when you see that and you realize everything we've overcome and everything our ancestors gave up for us to, to be even in the place that we're in or to be in a position to continue to fight now, um, you're very grateful. But um, I also had to pull from personal trauma, you know, I think Lee showing the house burned down really, um, really grabbed me. Two things grabbed me. When I pulled up, there was a weeping willow tree, a huge weeping willow tree in the front, which looked exactly like the weeping willow tree that was in the front yard of the house that I grew up in. Um, and then the house burned down, which was, I sort of looked at metaphorically as really the destruction of my family, the breakdown of my family. Um, and the betrayal, you know, because it's a huge betrayal um, that we're seeing happen here and the betrayal by this church that we went to. And so it was the weeping willow tree was in front of the house that we lived in when we were still a family. And um, so it was, you know, a combination of those things that came together. And then also my cast, you know, I could see the pain in their eyes. I could see the need to nurture and the need to love and to be together in their eyes. And, you know, um, and, and just Lee's commitment to doing the scene right, it was, it was really a perfect storm of things, honestly. Nice, nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Sharonda Williams, Pair of Weight. My question is for both um, Trevante and Andra. Um, one of the things that I find fascinating with both your characters throughout the course of this film is how their humanity or their own personal and professional narratives that they try to create or being, um, or basically being 
twisted, you know, with Billy, you know, she's speaking from her own experiences as a black woman in America, yet they're trying to silence her or politicize her in the wrong way. And Trevante, with your character, you're just trying, trying to exist and do what you feel is your duty to this country. However, you as a black man, that narrative has changed around for your character as well. And what I wanted to ask the both of you is, how was it portraying the duality that, you know, Black people faced back then, but also, too, have you found that these same narratives or things happen to in your own profession's current day? I'm going to let you go first, Bertrand. <laughs> <laughs> You're muted. Trey Prowse, you muted. I said, uh, ladies first, always. Oh, see, you know what? <laughs> um, uh, so, right, um, oh boy, that's, that's a big question. That's a great question, actually. So thank you, uh, Sharonda. I apologize um, for the rambling. <laughs> no, you're not, you're not. I'm like such a rambler. And then I always have to check in and be like, did I answer that question? And I, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm like a nervous. When I'm nervous, I talk and it sucks because it's embarrassing, but you were good. Um, uh, yeah, so I think, I mean, speaking on the narrative portion, right? Um, yes, I think, of course, I think what we see happening back then with narratives being suppressed and narratives, narratives being changed, we absolutely see it today. We see it in media, you know, when Black people are shown as looting, when Black people are shown and they're criminalized on, you know, in, in the news or, or in outlets or, or when even when it comes to movies, when we can win awards as long as we're portraying characters that are from the ghetto or live in the ghetto or doing things that white people are comfortable as seeing as black, you know what I mean? And so, um, and then with narratives back then, you know, of course her narrative was suppressed because she was talking about racial terror, lynching in America, and she was integrating audiences. And so, you know, Brian Stevenson actually puts this so perfectly and I'm just like blessed that I've ever had a chance to work with such a genius but you know he says we won the physical war but we lost the narrative war and the narrative war is so important because you can lose a physical war and continue a system of oppression right it's something that's more subtle it's a bigger institution that runs sort of quietly in the background um, but that it can persist as long as you control the narrative right and um, so of course I think we see it happening back then I think we still see it today uh, because people still have an agenda to continue um, to sort of control and monetize and criminalize black bodies. Um, and I think there's a fear, right? There's this idea that it's like, okay, we're, we're, we're for the liberation of black people, people of color, marginalized people, um, LGBTQ community, we're for their liberation as long as we stay number one, you know what I mean? And so it's kind of, you know, sharing that space is a scarier idea, I think, for a lot of people. So yeah, they have to continue to control the narrative. And it's our job, as Lee did so brilliantly in this movie, to take the top, the lid off of our narratives and to tell the world, yes, Billie Holiday was actually the godmother of civil rights. Yes, Beethoven was actually African. Yes, three black women sent us to space and programmed the first computer or the carver kept us from, you know, um, just completely being destroyed, econ economically destroyed during the depression or that a slave was responsible for netting us our, our independence as a nation. So it is our responsibility to research and to um, pull the lid or the curtain back on our stories. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm like, come on, Javante, you gotta follow that up. Hey, you can't follow that up, man. It's, it's <laughs> I mean, it literally, like she said, that's, this has been the struggle since the beginning of time, you know? And so this is what we're gonna continue to do. This is what we have to continue to do. And what we're privileged to continue to do and have a conversation with all of us doing. I mean, this is, yeah. this is what we love to do. You know, this is the reason. So uh, yeah, I love listening to her say everything because she really does breathe this, you know? It's amazing. So. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to ask about like the sex scene and how did you guys, um, you know, work on your chemistry? <laughs> like, hey, hold on, sorry. She said, I just like how you asked the question. It was well, uh, you know, we got people just watching yeah. us. This isn't just for us, this is gonna be on YouTube and they're going to want to know. So, <laughs> That is hilarious. So, you know, how do you, I mean, how do you prepare for something like that? I mean, what kinds of emotions, you know, were running, um, you know, through your characters in those moments? Because, I mean, it, it, it does kind of, I mean, it's 
it's vulnerable, it's real, it's very raw, and you know you can't help but notice it. So, mm. well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rhonda. Uh, Andrew, you wanna you want you wanna take it? You want? No, no, I went first. Ladies went first the last time. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I can say this. I can say this. I don't. We didn't have. Uh, we didn't rehearse or choreographer anything. Um, I think uh, we did pray beforehand, and I think you know it was. Uh, prior to stepping into that space, it was a really uh, beautiful bond that we shared, uh, and understood what we needed to do, and then we stepped in the space, and I think we were. We allowed ourselves to be present and to express that love in that way. I think that's the, the best way you can put that. And I have to give him so much credit here too, um, because I was terrified. I was very nervous. <laughs> um you know i mean and not just because of this nature of the scene, but also it's just my first movie. So like every scene is gonna be nerve-wracking. And I think this one even more so obviously because of what it was. But you know, I when you're in a scene and you're working with Lee was very, very careful and he cared so much about not, you know, I, I feel like we had a very short period of time to get it done. It was at the end of the day. Um, and he was also careful not to just like indulge. You know, Lee, I, I don't know if he focused. It was not like, okay, let's spend an extra hour or another, yeah. you know, doing this. So he was like, let's quit, let's get it in. You know, we had to bust the quickie. So <laughs> Um, uh, but I will give a lot of credit, honestly, to Trey. I was very nervous going in, but he has a very calming presence and he's a person of very high integrity. So once, once I realized I'm in a scene with somebody who I'm like, oh, he's not going to, you know, try to take advantage or just do anything crazy like that. And that he's committed to, you know, telling their story here. It made me feel safer to say, okay, cool. We can experiment and let's, let's do what we need to do, you know, in the scene. So but that has everything to do with his character and the type of person he is. You know, I, I imagine it's probably not always like that. So I was very blessed in that way. Yes, thank you guys. It seemed natural. That's why I wanted to thank you. bring it up. Thank you. Thank you. Ray Cornelius here again with Upfront Inside the Entertainment Industry. This question is for Andra. So much music was um, featured in this film and I know that it focuses on Strange Fruit, but I loved your version of All of Me. I love Give Me a Pig Foot and a Bottle of Beer. <laughs> what sort of went into, I guess, the, uh, the decision-making of which songs of her repertoire were actually gonna be featured in the film? Well, I'm, you know, Lee actually had an idea of the songs based off of what he had listened to, um, of the songs that he wanted to add in the movie. So we had actually a much longer list of songs. And then he asked me what songs of hers that I absolutely loved or that I felt were necessary to tell the story. Cause I am definitely a big Billie Holiday fan. And so, and, and I just thought it was, I think my contribution really was just, just the songs that she wrote. I think it's important to put at least one or two of the songs that she wrote in there, which God bless the child is one of them. So. Um, uh, so it was, it was that, it was also just understanding her voice, the place that it emanates from. And um, yeah, just, just the songs that told the story and that were different. I know for Lee as, and as well as myself, we didn't want to do every song that was in Lady Sings the Blues, you know what I mean? So we wanted to give people, you know, just a, a bit of a variety of songs. You have to kind of give them what it is that they know and what made Billie Holiday famous. but. But I think also, you know, with like Pigfoot and a bottle of beer, I just, I love that because the song is just so fun, but it also gives you another side of her. You know, like we know what it's like when you've got all of these social pressures and the pressures of whatever, financial pressures, you know, familial pressures. And so to just be in a place with your kin and to just like let loose and to be free, like it doesn't mean that there's not cops on the other side of the door waiting to like, you know what I'm saying? Like bust the place down but at least you have this moment to just have fun and to be with family and to do all that. So, um, I mean, that's definitely one of my favorite to perform because it was just loose, you know, it was like one of the very few loose moments on set. So it was, uh, it was really nice. And then all of me was um, extremely emotional uh, just cause it sounds like a happy song, but it's, I mean, it really means take all of me. And I think it represented what myself, what Lee did on set, what Susan did in the script, you know, what Trey did with Jimmy Fletcher, what all of our characters did, we really, we gave ourselves 100%. And so that song reflects that, I think. Absolutely, bravo. Thank you, thank you, Ray. Good to see you, by the way. <laughs> Mercedes here again, just one more question to close this out. Andrew, you said a few times already that Billy was 
the godmother of the civil rights movement. So she kind of set a precedent for entertainers to come um, to speak up. Do you think that entertainers have a responsibility to speak up and speak out against injustice? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, yeah, I do think they do, but not just because they're entertainers. I think they, they we, we're people, we're humans, you know what I mean? So I think we just have a human responsibility to other humans to, um, to, to speak up about issues like that. Also, I don't know, for me, it's a faith perspective. So not, not everybody will necessarily agree, but I, I believe that we were designed and we were put here to be servants and to serve each other. You know, there's the scripture that I love that says, regard everyone as higher than yourselves. And, and I, I know that, you know, I think for oftentimes that goes against, or they, people think it goes against this idea of self-care, but the picture, the broader picture of it is that we all look at each other as higher than ourselves. So just like imagine a beautiful world where everyone regards each other as higher than themselves. Everyone is loved and everyone is taken care of and supported. So I, I think we have a responsibility, not just as artists, yes, because we have a platform, but just we're humans, you know what I mean? And you, 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 you get back what it is you put out. And so I think that as a, as a, a contributing member of human society, then I think we should definitely use our platform. Trevante and Andra, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. On behalf of the world's largest group of black film critics, thank you for watching Africa Roundtables and have a great day. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Absolutely.